Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Cortex class video. In this video, we're going to be talking about one of the issues that liberal democracies all over the world grapple with, and that's to what extent should we agree to limit our freedom in exchange for security? And it's really a core question in the social contract idea of how societies are governed. And it's really this tug of war between the ideas of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, right? These two guys who had these ideas about whether individuals should be allowed to be totally free, as believed by John Locke, or that people should give up their freedom in exchange for security, as believed by Thomas Hobbes. Right now, I'm filming this in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis in Alberta. And the public health orders on the recommendation of Dr. Dina Hinshaw, who has really been doing a fantastic job making really effective recommendations and communicating those recommendations exceptionally well to the public. And some of those recommendations have been the closing of schools, for example, one of the reasons why I'm making these videos to begin with, and um, you're watching them at home. And she's also recommended the limiting of public gatherings and the list goes on, right? So we've limited our freedom to do these things in exchange for security. And as a society, we've accepted these temporary limits to our freedom because we want to flatten the curve of infections and support the healthcare system so that the healthcare system doesn't get overloaded like it has in some other parts of the world. But we're also at the point where our government is starting to talk about the transition plan and how we move from some of these more stringent measures of dealing with the crisis and starting to slowly transition life back to normal. One of the things that has been working well in other countries to try and mitigate the speed at which a disease like this spreads is through the use of what's called contact tracing. What this means is that whenever somebody is positively diagnosed with COVID-19, the quicker you are able to determine the people that have been in contact with that positively identified case, the more effectively you're able to get those people off the streets, possibly infecting others. Right? This idea is called contact tracing and different countries have taken slightly different approaches to how to do it, very often using technology to make it happen. On April 7th, 2020, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney addressed the province in laying out a bit of a plan of how we are going to start to end some of these measures and slowly move life back to normal. And one of the things he said was that when somebody is required to be in quarantine, he said, we will strictly enforce quarantine orders to ensure compliance, including using technology like smartphone apps when appropriate. And that raises some really interesting questions. Because, I mean, our cell phones have been tracking our movement for quite a while now. Like if you have Google Maps on your phone, one of the things that's awesome about it is that it can tell you how busy traffic is when you're uh, going out for a drive somewhere. But they get that data through tracking where we're going and tracking uh, how congested roads are based on your cell phone data, right? So this isn't necessarily anything new, but now governments are talking about it as a way to enforce some uh, quarantine measures in our country. And different places around the world have already started to do this to varying degrees in response to the COVID-19 crisis. South Korea, for example, has been using cell phone history to track people's movement. So if somebody has been positively diagnosed with COVID-19, they take people's cell phone history and credit card history and are able to map out where that person has traveled throughout the country or throughout whichever city they might live in. They then make that information public so that people can actually look at where these positive cases have been confirmed. And South Korea even sends out text message bulletins to uh, people 
saying where those positive cases have been identified. And because those cases have become public, third-party developers have even started to take some of that public data that the South Korean government is releasing and creating maps so that you know if you happened to stop at this particular mini stop on April 19th, well, you might want to monitor yourself for symptoms of COVID-19 and possibly isolate or quarantine yourself as a result. Other countries have taken even more extreme measures to try and slow the spread and maintain some control. In Taiwan, for example, there was a student who returned from Europe and he had to undergo a mandatory 14-day quarantine. Like most countries in the world, if you come from abroad, you have to undergo this quarantine. But Taiwan has taken cell phone tracking to an even higher extreme. And this student, Milo She, tweeted out that his cell phone died, and within minutes of his cell phone dying, he had phone calls from government authorities trying to make sure that he wasn't breaking his quarantine, right? So in Taiwan, the government is actually tracking live cell phone usage in order to maintain these quarantines and make sure that they're happening. The BBC, after seeing that tweet, actually reached out to uh, Milo She for an interview and they explained how Taiwan's quarantine system works. And from the article, it said that the island refers to its phone tracking system as being an electronic fence. Rather than ask users to download a special app or wear a location transmitting wristband, as has been the case in some East Asian countries, it uses existing phone signals to triangulate the owner's locations. To ensure users comply, an alert is sent to the authorities if the handset is turned off for more than 15 minutes. More than 6,000 people subjected to home quarantine are simultaneously tracked in this way. And to check that the phone has not simply been left behind, officials phone users up to twice a day to check that they have their mobile to hand and to ask about their health. Right, so in Taiwan, they've basically made having your cell phone on you at all times mandatory, you have to have it around. And if you don't reply to the phone calls, you might be under suspicion of having broken quarantine and a possible arrest might lead from that. So very strict. Here in North America, Apple and Google have actually gotten together to come up with a system that might help with this idea as well. So Apple and Google have created this joint project um, using Bluetooth technology to assist with contact tracing. And how this works is if you meet up with somebody and say you're having a conversation, your phones are actually talking to each other and taking a snapshot, not a picture snapshot, but a data snapshot of the fact that you were in contact with this person. If down the road, one of the two of you is tested and your test comes back positive for COVID-19, then your cell phone is going to send out a message anonymously to everybody who you came in contact with to tell them that they have been in contact with somebody who tested positive and therefore should isolate for the 14 days to not pass the disease on. So those are a few of the different ways countries around the world have been using technology and cell phones in order to stop the spread of COVID-19 in their countries and in their communities. Now, we don't know exactly what our Premier Jason Kenney meant by using cell phone technology to enforce quarantine orders, but those are some of the examples of how this is developing as we speak, right? So we don't exactly know how it's going to evolve here in Alberta, but at the end of the day, it does come down to that question of to what extent is it okay for a government to limit our freedom and infringe on our privacy in order to protect our security, in this case, public health, right? So what do you think? To what extent would you be okay with the government having access to your data to help stop a crisis like this, right? Because at the end of the day, it is extremely important to 
maybe do whatever we can, privacy data aside, in order to stop this crisis from becoming worse and to be able to return to normalcy as quickly as possible. But at the end of the day, we're also a society that values our freedom and our individualism. So I'll leave that with you and we'll see you again next time.